Hi and welcome to PGCon. Uh, this is uh, the first tutorial uh, at this PGCon, as far as I understand. My name is Ilya Kasmidimianski. I'm working for Data Grid, and uh, next two hours I will present you uh, a tutorial about my default PostgreSQL con file. So. Uh, why yet another default? Because as you probably know, PostgreSQL con file already has some defaults. Uh, so, um, well, basically uh, those defaults in PostgreSQL con file, they are quite, uh, so to say, conservative. Uh, they are designed to be uh, for like everything. So if you try to install Postgres on your coffee maker, you probably will uh, will do that and it would work uh, in this limited amount of uh, memory. So uh, then we are talking about servers which uh, normally have uh, more resources, more memory, um, lots of CPU, etc. Uh, we need some sort of different defaults. Uh, those defaults are more suitable for real work uh, real-world uh, workloads and uh, to uh, make your PostgreSQL more fit to uh, work in real-world uh, I suggest you some different defaults uh, which are um, better and I would say they are more aggressive uh, to uh, provide you more performance just before we start, uh, currently uh, we have lots of uh, settings in PostgreSQL con file, so um, more than 300, and uh, it, that, that amount grows rapidly, uh, and currently we have even more in version 12 and even more in version 15. Settings in PostgreSQL conf are supposed to be changed manually, and this is a main configuration file uh, which uh, allows us to change behavior of our database. Uh, not the only uh, way, so basically we can um, influence uh, the behavior of our database through uh, changing schema design, rewriting SQL queries, uh, etc. But PostgreSQL conf still is very important. So basically, uh, usually our uh, approach is uh, to uh, check PostgreSQL conf if everything is logically uh, looking good, and then um, we can proceed to uh, more fine tuning uh, by tuning SQL queries and things like this. So PostgreSQL conf is uh, still quite important. Uh, there is another configuration file which is called PostgreSQL autoconf and this one supposed to be changed only through auto system. So basically don't try to change it uh, manually like normal PostgreSQL conf. Uh, this uh, part is designed to, um, to allow us to manage a PostgreSQL conf uh, through uh, SQL through some automation tools and which is quite a useful thing sometimes. Uh, for example, you can um, input something wrong in PostgreSQL conf and you only find the problem then you, for example, restart the server. Uh, and through the alter system you always can get correct answer. Uh, was it successful? Was it not? Etc. And uh, there is finally a very useful uh, system view, which is called PG settings, which uh, combines uh, everything together. So you basically can see uh, where you change these parameters, uh, which limits has this parameter, which context do you need to restart PostgreSQL server, etc. But we will uh, talk about this in more details. So this is an example of uh, PG settings system view in expanded uh, display mode. So you can see uh, what fields uh, we have here. So uh, for example, we have the name of the settings, uh, current uh, settings, uh, units in which uh, we usually uh, do this. This one is in seconds. Um, it could be gigabytes, megabytes, etc. It's always good to, to know which uh, 
unit you use for this exact settings. Uh, the category, uh, which is sometimes it's useful, then you want to, um, for example, check everything uh, which... Uh, so this is basically a PG settings view. Uh, so um, it is an expanded uh, display mode. And uh, here you can see that we have a settings name, uh, current value, units uh, which uh, are used to uh, measure this value. Uh, very important thing is uh, context. I will uh, take a look uh, to the context on the next slide. Uh, and I would say uh, this is probably uh, the thing why I like these PG settings uh, quite a lot, because if you forget um, what you need to do to apply this uh, setting change, like uh, restart or just signal the server to issues uh, to reread config file, you always can check uh, context uh, here. So it's really, really useful thing. Uh, you can see uh, minimum value, maximum value, sometimes it's also, uh, also useful. And a uh, uh, very important thing is this pending restart uh, thing. So basically, if you change something, especially through alter system, you need to uh, be sure that this setting is up already applied uh, or you need to restart server and then it would be applied. So uh, this is a very useful uh, part of uh, PG settings. So more things about uh, context. Uh, there are different contexts uh, for different settings. So uh, the first one is Postmaster. So it's basically um, you can change things in um, PostgreSQL conf and then you need to restart server and then it would be applied. Uh, there is a super user backend. Uh, so basically you uh, can change the settings in PostgreSQL conf file, but you do not need to restart. Uh, Postgres after that, uh, it would be only applied for new sessions. Uh, and uh, basically why a uh, super user backend, uh, you can change that uh, parameter through uh, the client connection, uh, just like libpq um, pg options uh, environmental variable, uh, but um, you need to be connected as super user in this case. User, you can just change this parameter from uh, user sessions. That's quite uh, easy. Uh, internal, uh, that means this parameter is like pre-compiled. So some of those parameters you can change, some um, you could, could not. Uh, good example is, for example, block size. And um, I would say well, we need that quite rarely. So basically, uh, if something is internally compiled, uh, you don't need to change this parameter, I would say. Uh, backend is just like super user backend, but uh, you can do uh, this from normal connection, from normal user, not necessarily super user. SIGHUB, uh, you need to reread PostgreSQL con file, so you need to signal your server. And super user is just like user, but you need to be connected as a super user. So basically, uh, for each parameter in PG settings, uh, you can see its context. And based on that, um, you uh, need to restart, um, or you don't need to restart, or you need to send a SIGHUB signal uh, to Postgres. Uh, Postgres call conf. Um, uh, please do not change the order of the settings and you edit them manually. Uh, many people do this. Many people like to use includes. Uh, sometimes some automation systems uh, require them to do that. Mm. Generally, from my point of view, the good practice is just change the parameter in place and uh, do not uh, change the order of them. So basically, um, PostgreSQL conf is uh, not very smart. Uh, thing. Uh, in this case, Postgres just reads it as it is and the last uh, parameter would be applied. So basically, if you change the uh, order of the settings, uh, there are risks that you just uh, mix them up and uh, the wrong settings would be applied. 
So um, be careful if you want to do this. Uh, Postgres Conf, as I said, supports and uh, and you probably can use that. Uh, we usually do not do, uh, but as I told, uh, many people do this, for example, then you have different uh, instances and uh, you uh, build configuration files uh, for different machines uh, using some standard sections and then you include them. And all this check PG settings if you adopt because uh, if you use lots of things like includes and change in order and things like this, you need to be absolutely sure that uh, currently your database works with this uh, value of uh, this or that setting. So uh, don't hesitate to check PG, start, uh, PG settings. And off we go. Listen address. That's uh, the first parameter which many people uh, want to change. Uh, you can rather use the asterisk, uh, which means uh, listen to the all IP addresses or a local host. Most typical configuration for uh, your database is then you using PG balancer or another connection puller. So basically, uh, your database should never be faced to the internet, and in this regard, is quite good to use just local host and uh, go through the uh, PG balancer, for example. Uh, please uh, uh, make sure uh, if you use uh, asterisks that your database uh, is firewall protected because it's quite easy to make out of service sort of attack on PostgreSQL just trying to uh, authenticate uh, and Postgres run out of the connections. So it's like very vulnerable thing and your database should never be faced uh, to the external internet uh, without a firewall. So uh, make sure that your firewall is enabled uh, and you have proper rules for that. Keep in mind that IP version 6 should be firewalled as well, but it's like sort of the general rule. Max connections. Client connections uh, cause Postgres to uh, swap a heavy uh, Unix process, a proper Unix process. So basically, this parameter shows how many uh, those heavy Unix processes uh, could be spawned. Uh, and uh, the thing which uh, many people do uh, without actually um, back thinking, uh, max connections like 1000 will never work uh, unless you have lots of CPUs uh, on your machine. So basically, if you have 1000 CPUs, that would work. Uh, otherwise, um, you will uh, end up with uh, all the processes just waiting for CPU for disk, etc. Much better idea is to have max connections like default uh, 100 or 200. Uh, and small pool sizes in PG Balancer or another connection puller. Uh, please keep in mind that uh, we also have uh, auxiliary processes in PostgreSQL. So basically, Auto Vacuum uh, it's ha has lots of processes uh, like launcher of Auto Vacuum and all the workers of Auto Vacuum are separate processes. So basically, then you uh, calculate this uh, value. Just keep in mind that uh, not only uh, client connections are necessary uh, in this regard. So based on uh, amount of CPU on uh, your server, just uh, figure out uh, about safe numbers for that. Super user reserved connections, that's an important parameter. So basically, if all you run out of uh, your max connections, uh, you need to connect to uh, a database server in order to figure out uh, what is going on, uh, why all the workers are consumed, etc. So it's just a sort of a safety measure to keep some connections uh, to allow super user to connect in such cases. So set it to some reasonable figures like uh, 5, uh, better 10 or something like this, because uh, Safe is safe. Uh, TCP keep alive idle. If network is unstable, uh, five seconds can really help for your application. So basically, um, 
nothing to add more just increase this uh, tcp keep alive idle and it would be probably uh, better for you than just keeping the default uh, you can uh, also change uh, TCP keep alive interval, uh, set it to one in TCP keep alive's count. How how many times uh, you can repeat this? Shared buffers. So it's a huge topic actually, and uh, there are lots of uh, discussions about it. Uh, which settings is better and uh, there are lots of beliefs and sometimes even superstitions. Uh, how to set shared buffers properly. So what it is, uh, why shared buffers are important. So basically then your database reads the data from the disk, uh, it takes the blocks from disk and put them to the memory. And all the backends can use this sort of a cache. So shared buffers uh, are uh, the settings which uh, it says Postgres uh, use like this amount of memory for those shared buffers. Why it is actually tricky? Postgres Co heavily relies on uh, operation system mechanisms. So uh, then you are mm, reading the page from the disk. It first goes to the uh, kernel buffer and then to uh, user space to shared buffers of Postgres. So basically it's uh, buffered uh, reading uh, and uh, this uh, page should be first put it to the uh, kernel buffer and then to shared buffer. Uh, that's the source of a uh, first rule of thumb, 25% of memory which you have on your machine. So basically like uh, some Oracle users are familiar uh, with that. Uh, one of the best practices to use like 40% uh, for system global area for those shared buffers uh, in Oracle words. Uh, in Postgres, if we try to do that approach, uh, like using 50% of RAM for shared buffers, we will end up with uh, double caching. So basically we first put that to kernel buffer and we cannot use that directly. And then we uh, put this data to uh, shared buffers uh, and that's not very efficient. So um, if you have a large database which doesn't fit to, um, uh, to memory on your machine, better use uh, 25% uh, of RAM. This is like first good uh, way to set uh, shared buffers. But to use uh, 16, 32, 60, uh, 4 or more gigabits of shared buffers, uh, to, to use that efficiently, you need a proper disk. So basically, if you have some uh, old, outdated mechanical drives or SATA interface or cheap SSDs, uh, probably you cannot um, get any benefit from increasing shared buffers just because it, it would be a bottleneck on the different level, so on, on the level of the disks. If your database is definitely smaller than um, RAM and you are sure that uh, it wouldn't grow overnight uh, tremendously, uh, probably more aggressive settings for shared buffers um, could work for you. So 75% of RAM or sometimes even more. Uh, be careful with these settings because if uh, your database um, will grow overnight and that would be like very bad for you probably it can cause some sort of uh, not quite desired behavior like om killer will uh, come and kill your postgres coil but uh, this is very efficient if you have heavy load and uh, your database definitely fit into ram uh, well, uh, what is with that uh, double caching, probably, would you ask? Um, and uh, that's not a problem anymore, because if we have a lot of memory, we just uh, can be sure that we fit everything into shared buffers. And um, OK, well, it could be double cached in kernel buffer, but we don't care in this case. So it, it's like another approach which one is better uh, it's could be your decision then 
So another important topic is uh, huge pages. Uh, I mean, huge pages as a setting of PostgreSQL conf. Uh, and um, by the rule of thumb, when uh, there are a lot of uh, shared buffers uh, in your installation, uh, you need to use uh, huge pages uh, to benefit from that. So uh, what uh, huge pages are and how to work with them? To understand uh, how uh, huge pages help uh, your PostgreSQL to work, uh, it's a good idea to understand how uh, memory allocation in Linux works. So basically, uh, CPU operates uh, with a concept of uh, virtual addressing of memory. And of course, uh, this concept is quite nice uh, and uh, very useful for uh, easy development of software. But in reality, uh, memory is uh, physically addressed. So uh, for CPU to operate with uh, memory pages, uh, we need to make uh, a procedure of so-called translation from uh, physical addressing to virtual addressing and uh, for uh, this process uh, is responsible the special unit in the kernel which calls memory management unit and um, it saves uh, the result of this uh, translation uh, from physical to virtual addressing into so-called uh, translation leukocyte buffer uh, it's a buffer in kernel which um, saves uh, the results of this uh, process to uh, get uh, the pages uh, from memory faster to the CPU. Uh, so basically, uh, it's a nice mechanism, but, um, but in reality, if we are dealing with uh, large chunks of memory, as we do with uh, huge shared buffers, it is not uh, that convenient anymore, because by default, this um, page uh, in memory is uh, 4 kilobyte and uh, if uh, we have a lot of memory uh, this translation leukocyte buffer grows uh, to very uh, large size uh, it's in reality is more complex so um, there is uh, some limit uh, for the size of TLB but uh, for us now it's not uh, that important so conceptually the problem uh, of large TLB is the typical problem of inefficient caching so then it is large uh, it takes too long time to find uh, a page in it uh, and uh, it doesn't work uh, that good as uh, it's supposed to be. In the same time, uh, it is um, actually better to use uh, some huge chunks of memory, some large pages, uh, to uh, allocate uh, memory for things like shared buffers, because it's just like statically allocated thing uh, on the start of uh, PostgreSQL server. We do not need to use this flexible mechanism of memory allocation in small chunks. Uh, and this uh, concept of huge pages was introduced in Linux kernel uh, to make actually uh, databases uh, work better. So for that purpose, uh, we have a huge pages setting in uh, PostgreSQL conf. Uh, conceptually, to benefit from huge pages, uh, we need to um, care about two steps. First of all, huge pages should be enabled in uh, Linux kernel. Uh, and uh, second thing, uh, our application, our Postgres, should be aware of um, those uh, huge pages and uh, should be able to use them. So huge pages on in PostgreSQL conf is responsible for the second part. So basically it uh, allows our Postgres to benefit from huge pages. Uh, you can uh, switch it off, you can switch it on, or set it to try. So try at PostgreSQL in this uh, case will check if allocation of shared buffers from a uh, huge pages segment, huge, uh, huge pages pool, uh, is available, and if not, it uh, just allocates shared buffers from normal memory. Then uh, we set huge pages to on. Postgres tries to locate uh, shared buffers from 
uh, huge pages. And if it is not possible, for example, we do not configure uh, the kernel properly, uh, it just uh, don't start and says uh, that uh, we need to configure huge pages. So um, generally, we usually uh, configure them in kernel and uh, set huge pages to on. Uh, to configure that in kernel, the first part uh, of uh, the deal, uh, we use um, uh, two uh, system cartel uh, parameters. Uh, and then huge pages, it's just uh, calculated by us uh, pool size for huge pages. So we basically, we're figuring out uh, how many uh, memory we uh, need for our shared buffers and uh, multiply that to the size of a huge page and um, that's that would be our uh, nr huge pages uh, and that's normally enough but to be on a safe side we usually also uh, use the uh, vm nr of a commit huge pages parameter and uh, this is uh, more uh, tricky. Uh, to use this parameter, you need to keep in mind uh, that it allows you to allocate more uh, huge pages uh, than you initially configure it. But it's not a good idea to, to do like this. The much better practice is actually to allocate enough uh, huge pages using NR huge pages. Uh, why we uh, use this in our commit huge pages? Uh, it can comes to uh, some misconfigurations. So basically, uh, then uh, you initially allocate a certain pool of huge pages, uh, then you increase amount of memory on your machine, and then you forget to uh, increase in our huge pages or if you simply miscalculated some things, uh, and then uh, Postgres cannot uh, allocate this. So basically, uh, it's sort of uh, mm, uh, sort of uh, the same safety measure like swap. Uh, just good to have that, but uh, don't use it. So basically, you can put on monitoring uh, where your Postgres allocates uh, huge pages and take a look that normally uh, we do not use uh, this over committed huge pages and they use normal huge pages. So uh, this is uh, the second part uh, on the uh, kernel side, uh, how to configure huge pages. Uh, it's also good to know that um, if you use huge pages for uh, your shared buffers, those shared buffers will never go to swap. So using huge pages prevents uh, kernel to put those memory in swap. And this is also beneficial for Postgres because uh, you don't want your shared buffers uh, to be swapped because it would be like very, very slow in this case. Workmem. So basically it's uh, how many RAM should the process consume? Uh, Postgres workers use uh, this RAM for sorting head joints, etc., etc. Uh, surprisingly, lots of people have problems with these settings because uh, it's quite sometimes quite not non obvious uh, how to deal with that. A good starting point is like 128 megabytes. Um, that would would be not bad, and then you can figure out uh, how many uh, actually work mem do you need. For example, if you are um, doing lots of sorts uh, to prevent them swapping on disk, uh, you probably want to increase amount of word mem. Uh, be careful, uh, too high setting can cause uh, out of memory killing. So it's quite tricky for many people because if you have uh, like uh, 100 uh, connections in Postgres by default, uh, you can multiply that to uh, the single work mem and uh, probably if uh, this uh, amount exceeds uh, the size of your free memory, uh, you can run into um, out of memory killing. Uh, the trickiest problem is that actually uh, work mem is uh, a strange setting in terms that uh, 
it recommends Postgres to use uh, that maximum of that amount of memory, but there are some corner cases then uh, Postgres can actually uh, use more than one uh, mem, you know, one size of work mem you know, for a single query. Uh, and um, that's why it is tricky. Uh, I always try to be conservative in this regard to prevent out of memory killing uh, because uh, that, that's a bad thing uh, generally. Uh, some people uh, just use higher settings for work mem um, and arguing that uh, they never reach actually those uh, huge figures, but it helps uh, for those workers who uh, actually need work memory uh, to uh, make their swords and things like this. So I would suggest to be careful in this regard and then gradually increase uh, work mem, uh, for example, procession uh, where you actually need this as it could be individually configured for each session. Maintenance work mem is the same thing as work mem, but uh, for um, some maintenance operations. Uh, so um, basically uh, most useful uh, this setting is for uh, index rebuild. So it could be by default not very high, uh, but um, you can use uh, that for create tendons concurrently and things like this. Uh, in this case, uh, we usually suggest to uh, increase this amount uh, manually in exact uh, session, then, for example, create the index, and then uh, return that uh, to uh, default values. Uh, then you increase that for rebuilding index, it could be like uh, very large, several gigabytes, for example, really helps and it speeds up uh, creating this concurrently quite, uh, quite good. Autovacuum work mem is uh, a part of uh, maintenance work mem and it could be smaller. So basically, Autovacuum uh, needs some memory to work, uh, but uh, if you try to increase that to several gigs, it doesn't uh, speed up Autovacuum. So it's convenient to have those two settings uh, 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 configured separately. So those two settings could be configured separately manual vacuum settings. They are not that important because usually you are away on auto vacuum, but if uh, your auto vacuum is not configured properly, for example, uh, some parameter is not set uh, properly, uh, Postgres will fall back to vacuum settings. So um, for those things and for manual vacuum as well, those settings are quite important. Uh, here's my suggestions. Uh, what you put in those settings. We'll tell about this math uh, in more details when we'll discuss uh, auto vacuum settings. But the idea is then your vacuum uh, reaches uh, its cost limit. So it's st standard Postgres call cost uh, of like reading one page uh, from the disk. Uh, that's cost uh, like you can see in explain, explain and analyze. Uh, so then Postgres hits a vacuum cost limit. It's slightly smaller than by default. By default is 200, I believe. It uh, delays. Uh, and th this idea was uh, to reduce uh, uh, footprint of uh, vacuum uh, on disks uh, mostly. Uh, so basically, uh, Auto vacuum reaches its cost limit, then it delays, uh, then uh, the cost actually counts against uh, miss or dirty or heat, and then uh, again it hits cost limit, then delays, and then uh, once again. So this uh, particular set of the settings allows uh, vacuum to work more aggressively because today disks are better, faster, etc. So um, we'll talk more about uh, vacuuming, then we'll talk about auto vacuum settings. Uh, right ahead log. That's another important uh, pack of uh, settings which can affect your performance quite seriously. Uh, usually uh, we use a uh, whole level replica at least uh, because um, usually if you have PostgreSQL uh, 
you usually use it in high available configurations. So basically you have a primary uh, and you uh, have a replica. And to make that working, you usually need a wall level at least replica. And that allows you to make backups as well. Checkpoint timeout. So basically from time to time, a PostgreSQL issues checkpoints. Uh, checkpoint uh, is a synchronizing uh, operation for all the duty pages in uh, shared buffers. So basically uh, the wall magic of um, page uh, model uh, in PostgreSQL, uh, like in any other relational database which uh, uses this page model, uh, we uh, read uh, pages from the disk, uh, put them into the memory, and if we change anything uh, within this page, even single row uh, in a single table, we mark uh, entire page as dirty. Uh, so um, uh, we are write and write head log. We have those dirty pages. But from time to time, we need to sync uh, those things uh, with uh, the with the disk. So from time to time, Postgres issues a checkpoint, and all those dirty pages are going to the disk. And this timeout, uh, we recommend to set uh, to one hour. Uh, that allows Postgres um, take a lot of dirty pages and then send them um, to the disk. So there are two settings which can regulate uh, checkpoint uh, issuing. There is checkpoint timeout and max wall size, uh, and whichever came first. So if timeout exceeded or we have enough write ahead log uh, to um, issue a checkpoint. Uh, basically, um, you can make checkpoints quite frequent and this is generally if you have heavy workload is bad for performance but uh, you theoretically can uh, recover your database faster because uh, if uh, you have checkpoints quite frequently you need only replay uh, right ahead log um, during recovery uh, only uh, for this small period of time. Uh, generally, for performance, I would prefer to use max wall size uh, because it's quite predictable how many um, dirty pages you have. Uh, you know uh, the throughput of your disk system, so you can uh, relay on uh, those parameters uh, more accurately. Uh, and normally, uh, we do not uh, recover a database uh, if we have some sort of a disaster. Normally we uh, switch back to replica, promote it, and then we figure out what is going on with uh, our X primary database. So basically for only for a single server installation without any replica, um, this checkpoint timeout could be too high. So my suggestion is just to have max wall size um, at some reasonable uh, figure like uh, several gigabytes depends on how uh, much uh, wall you produce in 60 minutes uh, and uh, how fast your disk system is. Another good parameter is a checkpoint completion target. And uh, I would say um, I do not see um, lots of cases then you need something other than uh, 0 0.9. So what's the meaning of this setting? You um, issue a checkpoint uh, and checkpoint can be made very aggressive or less aggressive. So basically the idea if you put a zero um, point one in checkpoint completion target or it would be like 10% in this regard. Um, your checkpoint I would try to issue checkpoint quite aggressively. So all the F things uh, which are called uh, would be uh, called like simultaneously. And the idea is to finish checkpoint uh, in 10% time uh, before uh, the next checkpoint. Uh, so um, basically it's a bad idea because your disk system would be overwhelmed uh, with lots of in input output operations and then 90% uh, of time it would be like idle. So um, our suggestion is usually to use uh, this 
maximum spread of uh, checkpoints. So all the time between checkpoints, uh, Postgres finalizing this uh, disk input output operations. So uh, 0 0.9 or 90% is a very reasonable setting for that. Background writer. Background writer helps Checkpointer to send uh, those dirty pages to the disk. And uh, it's like very strange part of the PostgreSQL environment. So it's old and uh, needs a massive overhaul, uh, but uh, sometimes it actually works. So, um, uh, well, it's not very good part uh, of PostgreSQL code base, but anyway. Uh, all settings uh, which we can uh, change for BigWriter, we just set to the maximum. So BigWriter delays, uh, then BigWriter uh, scans through the pages to find uh, dirty pages uh, with uh, some uh, factor or uh, last recently used multiplier and uh, then it delays. So, well, um, BigWriter delay is not the maximum, it's actually the minimum, the m most efficient thing. Uh, you cannot set that uh, to less than uh, 10 milliseconds. Uh, this set of uh, parameters, um, just like with uh, Wacom, uh, allows BigWriter to work uh, very aggressive, well, it's not aggressive, it's all the aggressiveness it can, uh, actually. Uh, so basically it delays uh, the smallest amount of time, then scans uh, as much pages as it can, and then it delays again. Effective IO concurrency. Uh, it's one by default, uh, which enables prefetch. Uh, and documentation recommends uh, some higher values for storages with higher parallelism capabilities. Uh, and for us, those storages are actually SSDs. Uh, actually, it doesn't look like it works well. So uh, there are uh, some discussions uh, about this on PostgreSQL mailing lists, uh, and uh, there are some evidences that sometimes just completely disa disable uh, effective uh, IO concurrency works better than uh, actually trying to figure out uh, which parameter is better. So uh, I would not uh, recommend uh, actually to do anything with uh, effective IO concurrency, try to uh, switch it off. Um, I never seen actually on modern disks any efficiency on playing with high parameters like documentation suggests. Must have optimizer settings. Uh, well, must or, or not, it's difficult questions. Uh, effective cache size, uh, usually we recommend to set it mm, shared buffers multiply two or slightly less. This is not a parameter which uh, works quite straightforward. So it's like gives an optimizer uh, an advice, um, how many cache do we have? So quite theoretically, um, it's supposed to be two types of shared buffers because we can use kernel buffer and shared buffer, but actually um, it more relates on the size of shared buffers because uh, we cannot get uh, things directly from um, kernel buffer. So it could be slightly less than two times of shared buffers. Uh, if you set that to some crazy parameters like 10 times more than shared buffers, uh, it uh, wouldn't work quite well. Uh, all the things between shard buffer size and two times of shard buffer size uh, work. Uh, default statistic target uh, 100. That's a reasonable parameter for optimizer st uh, for statistics which optimizer collects. Uh, sometimes you can change that, and that could be uh, like not quite good result sometimes because uh, in the histogram. Uh, of max common values, for example, in statistic, uh, you will have uh, some strange figures if you, for example, uh, set default statistic target too low. So 100 is a reasonable parameter for this. 
Auto vacuum. So uh, we are starting a large topic. Uh, auto vacuum is very uh, common source of uh, mistakes and troubles in PostgreSQL. So um, let's go through auto vacuum settings, uh, which supposed to be changed anyway uh, if you're working with Postgres. So auto vacuum vacuum threshold uh, 50 and auto vacuum vacuum scale factor uh, 0 0.5. Uh, 0.05 or 5% uh, actually. Uh, so what does it mean? Uh, so uh, auto vacuum uh, routinely checks your table if it needs to be auto vacuumed. And uh, usually there are two parameters which control that, uh, whichever can first. Uh, you can change uh, 50 rows uh, in your uh, table uh, or 5% of uh, your table is changed. Uh, so whatever came first, uh, then auto vacuum uh, starts to auto vacuum uh, your uh, table. Uh, those settings are um, quite reasonable for uh, any reasonably heavy loaded database. And basically, if your database is not very heavily loaded, uh, I would suggest just leave those parameters like this and uh, it doesn't hurt. So our goal uh, then we're setting up auto vacuum uh, to make it aggressive enough uh, and to uh, make auto vacuum working in small chunks frequently uh, to avoid all the problems which could be caused by auto vacuum which runs for for hours and um, interacts with uh, other database operations uh, prevents us from running. Uh, different demails and things like this. Auto vacuum nap time. Uh, auto vacuum nap time is just uh, how many uh, seconds auto vacuum uh, sleeps uh, between uh, scans, uh, which is one second is a reasonable parameter for that. After vacuum max workers. Uh, if we have enough disks and enough CPU, we usually increase uh, auto vacuum max workers to something like 10, sometimes even more. Uh, by default, it's free, and sometimes uh, it is a problem because one auto vacuum worker can go through one table, uh, and if uh, there is a lot to do for, for this worker, uh, it will like auto vacuum the table. Uh, another one would be uh, auto vacuum, auto vacuuming uh, another table, uh, and uh, if uh, they work intensively, uh, actually will they would be all busy with uh, those uh, three tables, uh, and our tables uh, would be not vacuumed on time, which means uh, those two parameters make no sense. Uh, there would be more changes uh, in those uh, tables before auto vacuum can actually start. So um, uh, sometimes we suggest to increase uh, amount of auto vacuum workers uh, to, to make this uh, queue more efficient. Auto vacuum analyze threshold and auto vacuum analyze scale factor. Those uh, two parameters are just like auto vacuum vacuum threshold and auto vacuum vacuum scale factor, but for uh, the analytics uh, for uh, optimizer. So basically auto vacuum daemon uh, makes uh, more than one thing. Uh, another thing is analyzing uh, the tables and it could be set like auto vacuum vacuum scale factor sometimes uh, more relaxed, uh, sometimes the same. Uh, it depends how often you need to collect uh, your uh, optimizer statistics uh, on particular tables. If uh, your data changes uh, rapidly, uh, it's recommended to um, make those parameters more aggressive uh, or more relaxed if you don't need that. The third important thing which Auto Vacuum Demon does is uh, actually um, so called Auto Vacuum to prevent. Uh, wraparound, analyze to pre prevent wraparound. What it is wraparound and why it is important. So basically mm, PostgreSQL um, operates within MVCC concurrency control model. 
and uh, basically if we insert something to PostgreSQL we create a new tuple in some page uh, when uh, we update this we actually do not update exactly that tuple we uh, insert the new version and delete an old version but uh, in reality we even do not delete uh, the old version so we mark it like supposed to be deleted um, that was um, a concept many years ago and if it is the best scenario uh, there are lots of discussions uh, among postgresql people but uh, in reality it works like it works uh, and the idea of transaction in PostgreSQL has size of uh, mm, a normal integer. So it's not a big integer or something like this. Uh, so periodically we need to rewind those transactions and uh, AutoVacuum daemon is responsible for that. How it works. So uh, imagine a sort of timeline uh, and certain uh, old uh, transactions uh, created some dead tuples which could be auto-vacuumed. Uh, so basically all of those old transaction IDs could be actually freed and we can use them in future for our new transactions. But we're supposed to uh, not allow our database uh, to ruin some important transactions just because they uh, need uh, some old transaction to be visible. So in uh, this uh, case, they, we only can revint uh, if we are sure that old transactions are no more in need by the future transactions. That sounds quite complex, but in practice, uh, we do not need currently a lot of things to do. Uh, we have two parameters to control that, and since 9.6, uh, we actually mm, uh, can live with normal defaults. So the first parameters are after vacuum free is minimal age. Uh, before uh, 9.6, uh, there was no so-called freeze map. Uh, freeze map uh, actually PostgreSQL uh, tracks uh, which um, tuples are frozen and ready to be uh, removed by vacuum and uh, really they free the transactions ID and they could be revint. Uh, so um, in older versions, sometimes we uh, often require changing this parameter to up to 1 billion because we need uh, some time to uh, issue this wraparound. So PostgreSQL need to uh, scan lots of uh, tables to figure out uh, where dead tuples are and uh, for that uh, process we need some time to uh, issue wraparound. Since 9.6, uh, most likely default settings are quite enough for most of workloads. The last parameter of AutoVacuum freeze table age. Uh, this parameter instructs AutoVacuum uh, not just uh, figure out uh, which uh, tuples could be removed, but uh, just to uh, scan for uh, all uh, the tuples uh, if uh, they could be freezed. So basically, if you decrease this parameter, most likely you will simplify uh, your wraparound, but it also causes um, more intensive, uh, more frequent scans of auto vacuum. Generally, I would say that's a not a big problem. Uh, so recommended settings uh, are looking something like this. Quite an important set of parameters uh, which uh, usually people forget to set is about logging. So currently we have beautiful things in PostgreSQL like pgstat statements, things like this, but still sometimes we need to figure out what is going on through the logs. So um, this should be configured properly. So log directory, which you are intend to use, uh, proper log file name, uh, which would be human readable and you can figure out how to use that and it, you can find uh, which log file corresponds to which day uh, log rotation age so postgres will do the log rotation for you 
uh, based on days than on size is usually better because uh, you can figure out the log belonging to the exact day and you can investigate your problem uh, retros retrospectively quite easy. Uh, there are some uh, useful ideas how to configure that. So uh, min error statement is error, uh, otherwise you probably will have tremendous uh, amount of logs, which is not very good. Uh, good starting point is to have minimal duration, uh, because if every statement will go to your uh, error log, it would be like not uh, easy to manage. Uh, usually we uh, use uh, like min duration like 1000 and if we need to troubleshoot something particular we just make sort of a sampling. We just uh, decrease uh, this uh, minimal duration parameter for a short period of time, uh, capture our for example problematic query and uh, then we uh, set everything back again. Uh, login checkpoints is quite reasonable thing. Uh, this is our favorite uh, log line prefix. So basically you will have everything you need to troubleshoot things like transaction ID, uh, virtual transaction ID. Uh, good idea is to uh, log log weights because uh, it's very common task to find those things uh, in the logs and that's why you need that. Uh, by default, you do not log statements, uh, you do not need that. Uh, log replication commands, that's very useful for troubleshooting. Uh, sometimes you need to log temp files, but most likely not. And very important settings, you need to set up your login time zone, uh, because uh, then you, you are unsure in which time zone it is, you basically uh, can spend a lot of time on figuring out when uh, this happened and uh, why uh, you don't understand this. So uh, explicitly setting time zone for logging is uh, a reasonable thing. Don't forget about uh, one uh, very useful extension, which I mentioned uh, talking about logs. Uh, this is a PG stat statement, uh, which is a shared product library. So basically you need to put that to PostgreSQL conf uh, and then you need to restart your Postgres. Uh, useful uh, parameters to um, work with PG stat statements uh, is a max statement of 10,000. Usually that's enough. Uh, and PG stat statements track uh, equal to top. So basically you will um, monitor the top of your slow queries, which will allow you to uh, figure out uh, which uh, query is troublesome. Uh, for example, after something was changed in application um, and the top changed, you will need to figure out what to do with these particular queries. And if you have any questions, uh, we'll have right now uh, question sessions. Uh, so um, I will be available for Zoom uh, and uh, we'll answer your questions. Uh, if you have any questions later, uh, just feel free to email me and to, to ask them. Thank you very much for attending this tutorial and have a nice PGCon.